Welcome to the Industry Hangout. This is Brian Patterson, and today we're going to meet with three um, primarily writers, but people who have done everything within the entertainment industry. This is my co-host. I'm Robert. I'm going to allow um, guests to introduce themselves. So, Allison, if you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Allison Burnett. I'm primarily a screenwriter. I've been living in Los Angeles since 1990. I moved here from New York City. Um, I've tried to balance my screenwriting between sort of small stuff that I um, have a deep personal connection to and then studio work. Um, I have directed a couple of the uh, three of the smaller movies that are the personal ones. And then I've done a lot of work for the studios and had a long relationship with Lakeshore um, Productions, which just uh, just folded and sold their library off. Um, I also write novels, uh, which again, I do for passion and and it's to balance this more mercantile side of the job. And um, now I'm, you know, the business has been pretty still during the pandemic. So I've been focusing uh, mostly on, um, on fiction these days, writing fiction. Alphabetical, so Doug? I'm Doug Wagner. I'm a, mostly a comic book writer, but I've, I've dabbled in a couple of other things. So I've worked on stuff like uh, Batman, World of Warcraft. Um, I do a lot of creator own stuff. Uh, most of it's just like Allison said, they're, they're passion projects for me and they're all very weird, which I enjoy very much. Um, and I've uh, dabbled a little bit in the screenplay business as well on the side, um, but primarily definitely comic books. Um, I'm originally from Florida. I now live in the mountains out in Utah where I can stay away from a lot of people because um, I'm crazy. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, let's see, I, got, I did two Kickstarters this year for comic books, which, which were successful, which was fun. And then I have a new uh, dark comedy horror coming out from Image Comics in, Jul in June called Vinyl. Are you protecting yourself from society by living in seclusion or protecting society from you? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one out myself. So you know, it's, that's always a debate, internal debate. <laughs> it's a fair question. <laughs> Hi, uh, I go by Terrence professionally. I go by Terry when I'm with a small group of friends. You can call me Terry. I've been writing, oh God, um, I've been making a living since forever, uh, since 1975. I've written, oh, I, I, you know, after this amount of time, I cannot remember all of the stuff that I've written. Some of it's been made, most of it's gets shelved by the studios, but they, you know, they pay you well on the way in. Uh, eventually I started directing, I've directed, I don't know how many movies I've directed either, 12 or 13, and then a ton of TV. I've been at this a while. I think I'm <laughs> older than all of you guys, maybe twice as old as some. Anyway, I love the business. I live in Vancouver. I came up here because I had an agent who said, if you go to Vancouver, I'll get you so much work, you won't ever be able to sit down ever. He promptly died. However, <laughs> upon moving here, uh, uh, he, he was still in LA, uh, but I have no regrets. Vancouver is a great place. Mm. I, I, I really love it. My daughter uh, thrives very well here. And after all, that's what really matters at the end of the day. Okay. Absolutely. All right, um, so we're gonna get started with our first question. Um, and we just wanna start at the beginning of how you guys um, sold or um, got hired for your first screenplay. Uh, Terrence, I know your story involves Jeff Bridges, so I wanna start with you <laughs> playing top with Jeff Bridges. My story involves Jeff Bridges? Isn't that what you're saying? You were playing softball and somebody found the script in the car? No, that wasn't uh, that wasn't Jeff Bridges, but it's a good memory. And yes, yes and no. Uh, I uh, <laughs> I don't know where the Jeff Bridges thing comes in. I wish I wish he were uh, part of the equation of me, but he is not. <laughs> but the the uh, football story. A friend of mine named John Byram, the screenwriter and director, mostly screenwriter sometimes producer, oh, a guy I went to high school with, used to play, I know who you're thinking of, you're thinking of Rob Cohen. We used to play oh. uh, touch football at Fairfax High and Rob Cohen and, and a lot of other guys played. 
and I was among them. And because of that game, that's right, my partner and I, my writing partner and I, like Alec Larmore, a guy I know from USC, played in that game. On Monday, we went to the Hamburger Hamlet. We're all sort of worn out and wasted. And while we were playing, there was a woman on the sidelines watching her husband play. And she turned out to be a woman, Candy Lake, who was an agent at Ziegler, Ross, and Discant. And we ran into her at the Hollywood, uh, at the Hamburger Hamlet. And, you know, we complained about being stiff. And she happened to say, what do you guys happen to do for a living? And we were able to say, well, we're writing something. So the way I got my first agent was to go and play touch football at Fairfax <laughs> High. Uh, uh, and then, but to continue that same kind of thinking onward, uh, later on, we had a softball game, uh, much more fun than touch football, a lot more relaxing because you get to sit on the sidelines a lot and drink beer and whatever. And that game went on for like five years and it was co-ed. So the more girls that showed up, the better we played. And uh, we had uh, Lauren Hutton played in that game. Randy Oaks played in that game. Paul Schrader. Uh, wow. Um, what's the big kid who played for the Angels? Um, uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt, what's it? Was a Disney actor and then became a big Kurt deal. Russell. Kurt, Russell. Kurt Russell. Thank you. Kurt Russell yeah. played in that Russell, game. Wow. Anyway, it was great fun, mostly because we met a lot of girls, but also we made a whole <laughs> shit ton of contacts, which, you know, happens when you're out there shooting the breeze and having fun. Wow, yeah, perfect story. Know, when, whenever people see, ask whether they should move to L.A., I always try to tell them, like, sure, yeah, there is work in other places like New York City, there, but there's 10 times more work here for a screenwriter or a TV writer, but... Um, but the way that you that, that it happens has more to do with softball games and yes. parties and incidental meetings and right. you know that kind of stuff than it does sort of traditional routes. It's just that it's it's everywhere, and that's why being a social person is important to be interactive, and it's a function of who you are and who you are as a writer and a person mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So it's all connected, you know. And in, it's it's very easy in New York to sort of be in seclusion and just drown in mm -hmm. those millions of people, but here it's much more of a community. It must be very tricky now for people dealing with COVID mm. and trying to be social enough to continue that kind of thinking. Well, they're doing it through, now they do it with social media. They, people make connections that way. Like, you know, writers see some hilarious person and go, do you want to do a pilot? And it's all happening on the, yeah. in the internet. Yeah. In or way, like this. In a way, you could yeah. say it almost opened more possibilities, whereas you might not meet that person in L.A., now you have the opportunity to network with them through the social or through Ryan. Zoom. Exactly. I Ryan through Facebook the same way. Right. Wow. And then Terrence, the that movie was The Howling, right? The one that I uh, I'll tell that story briefly. <laughs> I uh, played in that baseball game a lot, and a guy who'd been my agent for a couple of minutes, Kevin Sellers had a script of mine in his car. I don't know why. Uh, whatever, you know, take the script, do what you would need to do with it. He gave a guy named Jack a ride home. Jack says, gee, uh, the script, do you think Terry will mind if I read it? No, Terry won't mind. Take it. Jack went to school with uh, a guy named Mike Fennell. And Mike Fennell was looking for a writer to do the rewrite of The Howling. And Jack said, gee, I just read this great script that was appropriate. And it was about voodoo, the script was. And there's some crossover there after all. So we gave the guy the script. And next thing I knew, I was in a meeting for doing the howling. So wow. indeed, wow. playing softball led almost directly to having my first writing credit. Um, I am so excited to tell my story because I just quickly was like going through your resume and stuff. And we have the greatest connection to each other uh, professionally. <laughs> it's so insane. I can't believe it, but it absolutely has to do with my first job. Um, it's, it's so, so, so surprising. Um, I was living in New York City and I used to write plays. And then I wrote fiction for about four or five years. I didn't have an agent. I didn't even come within a mile of ever. I, get, I had one play produced when I was 20 years old and an unknown actor named 
Peter Horton and his fiance Michelle Pfeiffer were both in it out in New York. We were all 2021. 20, I never even right. saw the play. I was living in New York. Never even saw it. I had nothing happen in my career until I was 31. Mm. And um, and what happened was I uh, one day I was at the Cleveland Browns fan club of New York City because I'm a huge Cleveland Browns fan. And I met a guy and he, and he said, hey, wait, why don't we write a screenplay together? And I thought his, uh, and I had written a couple of screenplays. Again, no agent, no nothing. And I said, okay, I, because I thought his girlfriend was beautiful. And I thought, well, at least I'll get to hang out at this house. <laughs> so, and it's literally the truth. So he and I started to write. So he said, I said, what should we write? Like, what do you want to write? Do you have any ideas? So we're sitting around. He goes, well, we could write my friend Charlie's life story. Charlie used to be a bank robber. And he served eight years in jail. And now he's a bouncer at New York clubs and restaurants and stuff, New York restaurant. And I said, okay, well, so he picks up the phone and thank God Charlie was home. He came over and this sort of powerful, brilliant, articulate, funny Italian guy, sort of like a, like a Tony Danza guy, but sharper and tougher, just starts telling me these stories about his bank robbery and his, his life of crime. So he and I just sort of click. We have exactly the same birthday, the same year. We were kind of like, you know, polar opposites on the surface, but we had a lot of, lot of con um, connectivity. And we wrote together. So we wrote this screenplay about his bank robbery career. And the, meanwhile, the guy that introduced us was more of a facilitator, and he really didn't work on it too hard. So he said, um, so Charlie said, let's write another screenplay together. So Charlie and I wrote one about his time in prison. And it was a racial drama about black, black white relations in prison. So one day, Charlie calls me and goes, I don't live in, L in New York anymore. I moved to LA. I was at a club with Jason Bateman. We were partying and he said, why don't you come and move to, to LA with me? I mean, stay with me. So Charlie's sleeping on Jason Bateman's floor, going out to parties every night. He was a big, you know, partier in those days, not anymore. So he's out partying every night. I'm getting these calls, Al, I got us an agent. You know, I met this person, this person's reading our script. This person's reading our script. So he's got our two scripts and he's just peddling them out there. And then one day he calls and he says I, that he sold the script. Uh, the the the, the um, prison movie, and he sold wow. it. And this is a high-minded, like racial drama about about prison. You know, was we thought it was like sort of like our Shawshank, or you know, it was that kind of thing. Well, instead, he goes, he sold it to Roger Corman. <laughs> Terry knows where this is going. So I said, so I and I, so my first thought was, wow, good for Roger Corman. I can't believe after doing all this crap, he finally wants to make this really serious, great movie. Um, that's how naive I was. So I say, what the hell? And I had like a, a tutoring business. I, I was a, I was a proofreader. You know, I had a life. I just sold all my, like most of my crap. And a week later, I've moved lock, stock and barrel. I've moved to, to Los Angeles. And we go in for a meeting with Roger Corman and I'm sitting in his office and I look up and I see a poster for Blood Fist, <laughs> and, which Terry directed. And I say, look, and as a joke, because the whole mo movie is a racial drama based on that the lead guy has to be white because he gets caught between white supremacists and the, and, and the black gang and he's sides with the black gang and all this interesting stuff. And I look, and as a joke, I see this Asian American guy, and I look, and I go, "Look, it, it's our hero. It's Jimmy Boland. He's gonna." You know, and my friend laughs. You know, Charlie laughs. And a minute later, they walk in, and they go, "There's your, there's your lead actor." And now they tell us we have to cut half the speaking roles, half the locations, and the lead is now this Asian American guy that can't really act. In fact, Roger Corman said the great words. He said, "Please try to keep um, Don the Dragon Wilson's lines down to a minimum." He's the, he's the lead in the movie. Anyway, so that was my introduction to Hollywood. It was pretty brutal. I it's did, pretty awesome. Uh, clearly, I did Don the Dragon's first movie. You didn't know. He, he, oh, didn't, did. know, he didn't know anything at all. I had yeah. to teach him what a mark was. Don, yeah. you, you don't did Blood Fist 1. Like you did Blood Fist 1, and I did Blood Fist 3. They changed uh, our title to Blood Fist 3. You did Blood <laughs> Fist 1. He, he's up to seven or something. Yeah, they did like six. Wow. After right. the movie opened, they, they, after the movie came out, they called and said, "Would you be? We'd like you to rewrite the movie and set it in a Mexican women's prison. We want to make it again." <laughs> and we, did okay. to, we did tell him to go to hell. Um, that's, that's, that's Roger for you. So as much as I dis, I don't, I don't like to glorify the way that non-union places exploit and torture us for six thousand dollars, but it worked because mm -hmm. I'm one of those people that that I, my whole career started because of that six thousand dollars and that little validation that got me out here. Yeah, and within a year, we were in the guild. 
And within three years, I was had a serious career and I was going nowhere in New York. So wow. Go. Life is crazy like that. That's yeah. an awesome story. Doug. Mine's not quite as exciting as y'all's. Um, my, mine's more the, uh, the the untalented young guy who just keeps sending in submissions over and over and over and over. So much like you, Allison, like I didn't really break in until I was 34. But I mean, I started at 17 and I was writing pitches and I sent pitches um, all the time, almost almost weekly. Um, I had Randy Stradley at the time was the running Dark Horse Comics. He actually sent me a personal note saying, quit sending me the same pitch over and over. Because like I would tweak it. I'm like, well, maybe I missed something because this is a brilliant idea. I know it is. You know, I just he's not, he's not half Falcon. He's <laughs> half <laughs> Eagle. Exactly. You know, I just kept sending and kept sending. And luckily, you know, coincidentally, I'd made... My best friend in high school is Cully Hammer, who's, you know, he, he was the co-creator of Red, the movies, you know, with uh, Bruce Willis and stuff. Mm. He's a comic book artist. And um, he had kind of broken in when he was 19, took a little bit of, of time, but he and I had developed a project that his editor asked about. And that was actually how I got my first gig was through this editor that Cully worked for. And he said, hey, I, I got this guy that can write, you know, you should, you should take him seriously. And that's what kind of took me a bit. Like I said, it took a while, but it, that's how... You know, same as, you know, serendipity as everybody else here. It's just like, you know, knowing the right people at the right time and everything kind of comes together. And it's about, you know, I made this friend in high school that sat next to me. We both loved comics, you know, and then 10 years later, it turned into something. Great. So, you know, it's, it's you know. But the one I, thing you always see in common is, is putting it out there. It's the mm -hmm. constant. It's like it's like a lottery ticket. The, every Perseverance. Name on it. Every, yeah, never giving up. And, and, it's, and you don't do it because you're told to or because you're disciplined. It's because it's a need. It's like you're, mm. you're compulsive. Your OCD is focused on this thing. And it, it, you know, it's, just a, it's just a way of life. And I, th I think what's cool about what you guys, Terry and Allison have already said, is, is like that, like the, the social component, the, like, which I also think is good for writers to go out and be social because you gain experiences that you have to have to be able to write a story but also how it also helps your career down the road. So it's just, I think it's, I think it's interesting to like, yeah, you've got to get out of the house. You just can't sit in the house and write all day, which, you know, I think sometimes you see a lot of the right younger writers get hooked up on, you know, like, Oh, I need to keep practicing. I need to keep practicing. It's like, well, there's a little bit more to life than just writing. Like you got to go experience it to be able to do it. I remember having the thought in my head when, when, when Mark said to me, Hey, let's write a screenplay together i thought you know i don't know if this guy can write i only know him from the cleveland browns fan club yes his girlfriend's pretty but i thought i'm gonna have to get on a crosstown bus every single day when i'm exhausted but i know that when that's over whether it's four weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks i'm gonna have a screenplay and i know my name will be on it and it will now be then like my third screenplay and i just said i have to keep having things in the world with my name on it mm -hmm. and i went there and it turned out the guy didn't become a screenwriter he's a musician now um, but he, he, he's, he's always been good at bringing people together. And, and then even when Charlie said, Hey, let's write another one together. I thought, Oh man, this guy's a wild man. He's not really a writer. He's more of a rock contour. I had all the reasons I could, my, you know, I have friends that would have used those reasons not to do it. I have friends who make excuses for everything, but I thought when I'm done, I'll have another screen. I know I'll finish another one. Yeah. And that, and that was the one that made it all happen. So you just keep putting it out there. Yeah. That actually, so all of that, just now transition to the question I wanted to ask. So in unison with what Brian asked is a um, question I already immediately had when I found out we were going to be interviewing you three is what about it? What at the beginning, before you decided, what was it about the writing world that attracted you? What was, was there something you saw? Was there something you read? Was there something that impacted you so much? You said, I have to do this. This is this is what I love doing, or was it an well, accidental I, discovery? I, I, my goal is to be a director, and the mm -hmm. only way, the only guy who got hired in his twenties to direct anything was Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. So I said, "Well, you know, <laughs> that's a long haul. He's already done that." So uh, really, I had no choice but to sit down behind the typewriter, and I do mean typewriter at mm -hmm. the time. <laughs> of course, word processor. What a bloody miracle that was. <laughs> Anyway, there was no choice. They had to sit down and do it. The first one, the first several didn't get anywhere at all. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, I hooked up with a partner and we wrote something and that got a little bit of attention, enough attention that in, in fact, we got an agent and we showed it, we were able to show it to people and, you know, we got going. 
So in your case, mm -hmm. it was a necessity to achieve your actual dream of directing. Yes. Yeah, well, actually, the writing, there was no direct connection to the, uh, uh, between the writing and the directing, but uh, I don't regret having learned to be a writer for a single minute. Uh, in fact, I'm a much better director because I was a writer. I mean, being able to visualize something in the abstract on a blank piece of paper, it makes it a whole lot easier knowing you're going to go to a set where they're actually three dimensional things you can put the camera behind or look at and stuff like that. It's, it opens up your brain. Mm. It just don't open up mine. I think seeing examples of people when you're young that are doing something probably helps. I was a theater geek. By the way, um, Terry, I grew up in Evanston. I went to Evanston High oh, School. Oh, there you go. You're a neighbor. He grew up like two, two three, world. three suburbs away yeah. um, in New Trier. Um, and so, there, you know, we had great theater departments in the Midwest. These schools, my high school had 3,600 kids. So your theater department was like being in co was like college theater department. And, yeah. but I, you know, I remember seeing a friend's, in high school, a friend's father was writing a screenplay and he wasn't a professional. He was like hmm. in his, you know, in his underwear. I remember he was sweating like in his shorts <laughs> on a hot, humid uh, Illinois day. And on his wall, he had all these note cards taped up with all, and that's the first time I ever thought of that idea that the structure and he was, and, you know, hmm. I just sort of saw that. And then I, um, and my dad was a pretty famous biologist, but what his first love was he wrote novels and published a ton of poetry in very serious places and when he was young he was an idealistic writer so i saw my dad writing on a smith corona typewriter you know so that idea that you could be a writer was very real for me um and i think he, i just loved movies and then it really mm. when i first moved to new york to be a playwright i read adventures in the screen trade and that made a huge mm -hmm. impact on me i still think it's the best book about screenwriting i tell oh, everybody yeah. Every young writer, I say, look, I don't care if it was written 50 years ago. It just, the business has not really changed that much. And it still tells you so much about what it means to be a writer. Mm -hmm. So I thought, but, but in the end, you know, I, I would have been a playwright and written fiction if I had had enough to say in my 20s. But, you know, it, it's easier if you have really strong craft. It's easier to have a career, I think, in, in TV and film. Mm -hmm. If you have some talent and craft and hard work when you're young, when you're younger it's it's hard to write novels in your 20s it's hard to write plays in your 20s like my I, I wrote a play in the last five years it's better than anything I mean you need some maturity for that so mm. in a real yeah. way I always thought as a way of subsidizing my life and like Terry I wanted to direct and I wanted and I got a chance to direct um, some plays and and these three movies and it was very fulfilling but again it was subsidized by the studio the the screenwriting and so I'm very grateful for that Adventures in the Screen Trade is another North Shore guy, you know, William Goldman. <laughs> I Island forgot. Park. Island Where's Park. He... Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, growing up, I loved comics. You know, I, I started with the, you know, the circle racks at the 7-Eleven, you know, starting out reading, reading stuff like Casper and Flintstones, you know, and eventually mm -hmm. got old enough to graduate to superheroes like Fantastic Four and that kind of stuff. Um, and when I was young, my dad passed away. And I won't lie, like the X-Men comics kind of saved me at that moment. Like I needed something to escape into. And that was a big one for me. And then when I met Cully in, in high school, um, he and I just kind of started, you know, as, as young writers and creators do, we started talking trash about, well, if we were doing that movie or if we were doing that comic, this is what we would do. Because, you know, you think you can do better Experts. just by talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we started creating our own superhero team. And when I was 17, I, you know, it kind of dawned on me because I'm a little slow, I won't lie. It, it, uh, I just kind of went, you know, I think, I think I'm actually writing. And I loved it. I mean, I just fell in love with the idea of like daydreaming and coming up with these adventures for these characters and, and that idea of like when the character kind of morphs into their own voice in your head. And it's so easy to write it when you get to that point. And, uh, you know, walked in, walked into my parents' bedroom at the time, my mom's bedroom, and said, uh, you know, I, I think I want to be a comic book writer. My mom, of course, was like, that's a bad idea. Like, you need to have a backup plan. <laughs> so, but, Good for her. Um, yeah. And I <laughs> hope you say that to your son. <laughs> no, no. I, was, I uh, you know, I, but I was determined, you know, I mean, I'm hard-headed. And I was at that point, I was like, listen, I'll, I'll, I'm going to do what it takes to make this happen. And, you know, that's just get focused on doing it yeah. over and over. You were ahead of the curve because mm -hmm. these days everything you have to have a comic book consciousness to a certain extent. I mean, because I know so a much, I know a screenwriter. I, I know a screenwriter that whenever she writes um, a spec script, she goes and hires a young comic book 
writer, gives them a few thousand dollars, and they do like a rudimentary graphic novel of her screenplay. She copyrights it. She has it printed. She copyrights it. So when she goes in to sell her spec, she goes, this is based on my graphic novel or oh, my comic book. Brilliant. So what it does is, A, they think it's been legitimized when in fact it hasn't. But then mm -hmm. when the screenplay sells, because she was on kind of a roll, she now owns the underlying copyright. Wow. Isn't that smart? Great. Yeah. yeah. Great. I think somebody in this room might borrow that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I I do see it a lot in our industry. You see it a ton, like people that'll just put together kind of like a print on demand comic book, so that they can hopefully pitch it to somebody in Hollywood and turn it into a movie. And they're they're doing the same exact method you're you were you were discussing there, Allison. Do you, do you find that you your comic book stuff, your graphic novel stuff, that it gets that you connect to Hollywood? On on most of them, do you get some at least a call or a few calls or inquiries about? whether it could be a movie. Is there an interface between the two that you feel good about? Yes, it's, it's, it's fairly constant. Like even with the Kickstarter, the, on both the Kickstarters I did in the past like eight months, day one, we got calls from people, you know, producers and directors and people that are just like, hey, is this tied up? Like, what are you doing with this? So there is definitely like, like you said, I mean, there's just some kind of, for some reason they think it's legitimized just because it's in print, you know, and it's, hmm. I mean, I'm not gonna argue with them. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Doug uh, segued into the next question perfectly because he was talking about like wanting to write for like X Men and whatnot, and then like creating and stuff. So, like all three of you have worked on pre-existing stuff, like Doug with like Batman and World of Warcraft. Allison wrote one of the Underworld movies, and Terrence is director TV. So, like with the creative process of coming into like pre-existing universes as opposed to like creating your own, like what are the differences in the creative processes there? I, mean, I, I will lie, I struggle with pre-existing characters. Those, those, I don't feel like I do quite the amount, the quality of work on pre-existing characters that I do when I'm working my, on my own characters. It, it, and you're right, Brian, it's just a different mindset that I struggle with and I know that's my thing. Um, you know, cause I, I catch myself trying to write Batman for people that love Batman. I'm not writing Batman for Doug. Mm. And when I'm doing my creator own stuff, I'm writing for Doug. What does Doug want to see? What does Doug want to read? And that tends to be a little bit different. If, if you know, Brian, you know my stuff, you know, you know my stuff's a little odd. So like, you know, I, I can't do, you know, a blow up sex doll in Batman. I can do a blow up <laughs> sex doll in my book. So, you know, it's, it's a totally different mindset that I, you know, I'm, you, I'm dying. You and Doug and the sex doll. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that, that can work. So I'm, I'm dying to hear what Allison and Terry have to say about that because I know I Remember struggle with getting ideas in their head about a movie called Doug and the Sex Doll. It's like a, <laughs> yeah. I've been on both sides of the equation in terms of characters existing or not. I did the first what five years of Power Rangers. <laughs> of all the things I've done, and there's a whole vast raft of them. The one that everybody has always heard of, you guys are exceptions. Everybody's heard of Power Rangers. Oh, it's I've heard of them. <laughs> uh, and, and that, we had no characters yet. So we were creating them as we went along, which was actually fantastic. Would, would Kimberly do this? Well, she's, you know, she can get reduced into a, a bottle of soda pop. <laughs> what does her character do then? Well, I don't, you know, Fresh so there's scenarios. a lot of flexibility there. When I went on to do, uh, yeah, there you go. When I went on to do uh, Pacific Blue, they were just cops. Actually, in a way, the cops on bikes and the Power Rangers were really the same characters. There were five of them, and they saved the universe, right? That's what Marcus, cops do, right? Marcus Flanagan, right? Wasn't Marcus Flanagan one of the five? What, on on which he? show? I thought him, I thought he was on Pacific Blue. Maybe I'm wrong. It was a Marcus Marcus uh, another last name. Oh, then maybe I, I I know a guy named Oh, I think maybe my friend Marcus Flanagan guest starred on Pacific Blue. That's what it was. He guest starred. There, yeah. I, I, I once in a while will see my name connected to people I've never heard of, and oh, you work with them on you know <laughs> right, right, a right. lot of people right. went through that show, sure. just like all the people that went through my softball game. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, some of them, and there was one guy at least because he played in the softball game. So, hey, you played in my softball game when he came into reading. You've got the gig. 
So all it took was. I saw you, so you got it. Yeah. That's it. That was it. it. You dropped my pop fly, so you're in. I actually find writing pre existing characters like so friggin' easy. And I think, you know, like, I don't know what is it's some sort of chameleon thing in my brain. Like, once I just sort of hear the way they speak and stuff, I, I find that so reliable. To me, the, the challenge and the fear is, is writing original stuff. Um, mm. It's not that I don't, it's just that, like, I, it, because every day you wake up and you're staring at a blank screen and you got to figure, and to me, it's always about the bones and the action and the structure and the story. Once that's in place, the character and the dialogue, the, the flesh to me is always feels like the easy part. The hard part for me is that you have to assemble it correctly and what's going to happen. And, you know, sometimes you get a, write, a rewrite job. And on the one hand, um, it's for me easier because the characters are all there on the page. You're just rewriting. But sometimes there's big problems with story and there's big holes and big chunks that you have to reinvent. And that to me is where the pressure comes in. But if the, if the story is intact and I'm just being hired to re like, you know, when I did Underworld, they really kind of knew their story a lot of it. And they really just needed someone to assemble it to sort of, and then they wanted, and they wanted all the dialogue. I did almost all the dialogue. Um, and that to me is just pure fun compared mm. to writing originally. I had an important question. I was hoping to ask you three as well. A friend of mine is a comedian, but also a writer, a very good comedic writer. And he has written and pitched two major shows to two major networks and both were pretty much stolen. Um, and I know because I was on part of his, uh, when it was a web series before he pitched it. And um, how often do you hear stories of that happening? Has that happened to you? Is there anything you can do against that? You know, I always heard that it's exaggerated, you know, that like it rarely happens because they don't want a lawsuit because mm-hmm. even the threat of a lawsuit can just paralyze. I mean, if anyone with a credible, a credible claim steps forward, like the woman did on Amistad, I mean, against Spielberg, it just mm-hmm. throws it, it freezes the whole thing and they have to pay them off to get to get rid of it. Um, so I've always heard, you know, that it was, it was more rare than I think I did. The only time I, thing I had was I sold a movie, an original to a studio and we developed it a bit and it became sort of more of, as they put it, a dramedy than, than, the, than, than they wanted. And the next thing you know, it sort of disappeared. They just owned it forever. They gave me the full mm-hmm. amount of money and it was gone. And then three years later, they made a family movie that was eerily reminiscent mm-hmm. in sort of basic idea. Mm-hmm. And they, they made it more of the comedy they wanted. So they did the thing that they had wanted, but they really kind of, you know, there was just a lot of scenes that were similar and the basic setup was almost the same. And, you know, it wasn't a great feeling, but I did get at least get paid. And, mm-hmm. um, and but the funny part was, when I called a friend of mine at that studio and said, hey, where did the idea come from? Like that idea for that movie, they said, oh, it was, it was, it gener- it was generated internally. They said, yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, that's the closest a, thing to me. I had a film, the first one I sold actually, uh, sold the rights to, you know, they buy an option and they can do a lot of things with it. In the case of that one, they borrowed <laughs> the subplot. The two characters, mm-hmm. you know, had this subplot that was, absolutely distinct and they made in fact they made a series of movies about those two characters and i went to my lawyer tom pollock and he said uh, look we were robbed and he goes yeah you're right but good luck suing ray stark mm. he said you're, you're better off just letting it go than suing this you know he was a huge player and he might, have, he might have gotten a settlement but then you get sort of blacklisted your trouble. Well, that's 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 mm. what Tom was saying. It's mm-hmm. not worth doing. How about you, uh, uh, Doug? Anything in the in that world? Yeah, I mean, I think I hear this a lot, especially from young creatives that are really worried. So they get really precious about everything they're working on. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I mean, an idea is an idea, and nobody's. You know, I, I guarantee you could give Terry, Allison, and I all the same idea, and we would totally do it differently. And so I would say, don't get hung up on like worrying about somebody stealing your idea. Your job is to put out content, as much content as you can possibly manage. And, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, things are going to get stolen. I mean, that's just the way it is. But, you know, they're not going to do it the same way you're going to do it. It doesn't keep you from doing it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, I, yeah, don't. I, I worry about young creatives when they start talking, going down that path, because that can keep you from creating. And that, that's the worst possible yeah. thing you can I, do is I, stop I, writing. I, 
that's very sound advice. Yeah, you can you can't really copyright an idea anyway, only the, the way the idea is handled. Mm. Things like things like structure, the actual content of scenes, the way the thing progresses, that's the thing that they're very they look for. But you know, people have many people have had the same idea for things or similar ideas. About maybe. about ten years ago, um, there's two different movies that came out. Like they're both like about uh people that weren't in a relationship having sex and then falling in love. And then like 2011 or so, both uh, No Strings Attached and Friendship Benefits came out. So, so basically it's the same as that plot. All those body life. switch movies. Remember the body switch movies? Every mm. single vice versa and big and Face all those. Off. Movies, keep Technically. <laughs> and we did so many of them. Yeah. Yeah all the time right i mean the second like something like john wick comes out mm. then everybody's like hey let's do a john wick like movie you mm -hmm. know and so they're gonna rip the idea off whether you're you're the first one to do it or not you know so oh, like, yeah i just what about uh one. white house down and olympus has fallen right <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, there's like what, six of those now like, right? it's, it's insane isn't that the same movie <laughs> I see this go by on the cable i go what this again oh it's a different one <laughs> Where are you guys, Brian? Where are you? Are in Oklahoma? Yes, sir. And are you also in Robert? Are you also in Oklahoma? Uh, I'm in Florida, so I'm I'm uh, I'm an actor, but I'm also uh, active duty Air Force. I was an Army veteran, and I went back into the Air Force, but I'm still pursuing. I'm also trying to do a little more producing since I'm in the Air Force right now. Um, and uh, this these opportunities come along, you know, and I'm all for it. And if somebody has something, I'll definitely fly out and film something. And I still audition all the time. So, um, but yeah, I love Florida. We're on the we're uh, on the Emerald Coast, actually. It's not far, about five hours from Atlanta. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, you know, Brian and I met through Facebook, mm -hmm. and he um, was instrumental in helping me get a movie made. I mean, isn't that crazy? Wow. But yeah. Brian, you had connected with Brad Wyman, right, Brian? Yeah. And so, you and do. so he. And I knew Brad different. Wyman's name for 25 years. I just never met him. So he connected me to Brad Wyman with uh, a script of mine. And, and Brad said, yeah, I'll try to help you produce this. I'll try to raise the money. And then by sheer coincidence, a guy I knew that had produced, I hadn't heard from in years, called me. And he said, you know, and he'd made two documentaries. And he goes, you know, I really want to make a live action movie. And I said, hmm. oh, well, you know, I'm making, I'm trying to make this movie with Brad Wyman. So I have a name. I don't just say, oh, I have a script, right? I go, I have a <laughs> producer. So he goes, well, let me read it. So I'm like, he goes, can I jump in? Can I be part of the team? I go, sure. You know, so he jumps in. Brad Wyman quits a month later. And this uh, second guy goes and gets us the measly half a million dollars we needed to make the film. The next wow. thing I know, it's a movie. And it all starts because a total stranger writes to me on Facebook. Wow. The, Power of social media. That, um, he had, uh, it's an indirect sequel to his other movie. And like, I saw that movie and I, I was like, hey, is there a sequel to this? Because this movie is really good and I want to see something else like it. And he's like, yeah, but we've yeah. had issues getting the funding. And I'm like, hmm. let me look around for a producer. And because like, I, that's one side I don't know about because I kind of, a lot of the production side, but I've never learned how to fundraise. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Brad, uh, for you guys who don't know, like he was produced the Oscar winning um, Monster Ball with yeah. uh, Halle Berry, Billy Bob Thornton. Um, so, like, you know, he already had like an Oscar winning movie under his belt. So, like, I'll, he let me send him the script, and he liked the script. And, like, work on that first. Um, like, you know, you know, um, I, part one of the lessons I've learned from this is that you don't is is arrogance is a killer, and it's like I could easily there are so many got people in Hollywood that could have blown Brian off so easily. I mean, mm. all you have to do is be judgmental and go, who's this guy in Oklahoma? I don't know him. I'm somebody, fuck this. And mm -hmm. I think that, this has happened time and time again in my life where, I, I mean, I just want to tell a quick story, but I think this is a pretty great one. I used to go to the, like, you know, screenings at the Guild and I would run into this woman and she was the nicest woman to know. Her name was Jamie. And she goes, oh my God, you didn't know me that well, but I went to Evanston High School with you. And I go, oh, cool, you know? And so we would sit there and I'd see her like a good twice a year. We would just talk. And I actually had the thought, God, Allison, you're such a nice guy. Like, you don't know her from Adam. You're sitting here like yapping away with her. Like, you know, I had that thought. Her husband is in the business, she said. Oh yeah, well, he's in finance and da, 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 da. His name is Chris. And I go, okay, well. And then time goes by and I sell Autumn in New York and that's my big break and everything's going great. 
And um, suddenly the woman who runs the studio is fired right before we're about to start shooting with Richard Gere and Winona Ryder. It's really scary because the, you know what happens as soon as they hire a new president, it, it all falls apart. And it turns out the president of the company went home, sat by the swimming pool with a stack of scripts that he had to read of what they were going to make. And he read them and just re you know rejected one after another, except one, because his wife said, hey, I went to high school with that guy. Can I read that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> she cries and says, you've got to make this one. Oh, uh, wow. And I don't even put it together. They tell me the story and I go, oh, I wonder who, I wonder who his wife is. Like, I have no idea. I don't even know her last name. And then one day we're like six months later, I'm at another screening and I run to her and how are you doing? She goes, great. I said, how's your husband doing? She goes, great. You know, he's the head of MGM UA now. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> That's, That's amazing. I know. So, yeah, I can, I can tell you with 15 plus years of um, sales experience, that word of mouth is still the most powerful marketing tool there is period nothing else compares and it's pretty much free right you were talking with her gets to her husband boom there you go there's your movie wouldn't right. have happened otherwise basically right. yeah. <laughs> i mean and, it's, and it's amazing and they say is it who you know but who you know is a function of who you are the yes. kind of person you are so being a good person and listening to people and connecting to people and mm -hmm. remembering you know all that stuff being socially interactive is so much a part of it and and, and sadly a lot of writers are by nature really reclusive people a lot of them are, yeah. are antisocial and mm -hmm. that yeah, really so. does make it hard. Usually a partnership, there's one that's gregarious and one that isn't, or mm -hmm. your agent has to really do a number if you're gonna, you know. So um, what have like some of your like favorite projects been that um, you guys have worked on? Like I remember Terrence, uh, we asked him this when we were handing out over Zoom a few weeks ago. Uh, this was one that nobody's familiar with, but a story that was really personal to him out in the desert. Uh, so like, what are what are some of you guys like most personal or favorite stories that you've made? You were talking about mine. You were talking about something called Twice as Dead, right? Yes, that's what. It's yeah, my my wife and I sat down, and in I don't know a couple of weeks, <laughs> I don't know what prompted this. We wrote a story about the husband and wife who robbed the bank, succeeded the robbery, but fail at the getaway. She fall uh, because uh, all they do is argue. They're sort of George and Martha in uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. It's sort of a combination of that meets Duel in the Sun. I know mm -hmm. it's an unwieldy combination, but it, 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 they argued the entire time. The guy who gets them their fake passports tries to steal the wife and the money. And in the end, the husband and wife shoot each other on this hillside. Finally, I got the duel in the sun. Wow. Anyway, wow. It, it's the favorite thing of all the things I've done, partly because, well, primarily because we wrote it and we're proud of it and we financed it ourselves. We went out with those three uh, three chip DVD cameras and, and made something good looking out of it. And we sold it to some guys and, you know, I collect a little bit of money on it. I, I, you know, I'm not going to buy a new house on it. But it was satisfying to have sat down and written it, found some guys who said, yeah, let's make a non-studio movie, and then finally to go off and sell it. So it had all those aspects to it. As I say, I'm not going to get rich, but I'm proud of it. Twice is dead, it's called. At your local you Amazon. That up. Is, the, is the guy that plays the policeman in it the Mike Myers? No, it's not. No, I'm laughing. It's, looking, it's, it's not. Mike no. Myers. I no. thought you discovered You're Mike You're finding Myers. that online too, huh? Yeah, I'm looking at okay. it right now. I just think <laughs> that, Mike My, that, that Mike Myers is a real cop, I believe. Oh, that's funny. You know, you, oh, you, funny. when you have no budget, you've got to recruit yeah. from whence you can. I guess my, I mean, you know, I, I, my favorite projects are the ones that I directed and wrote because that's that's an incredible experience. I mean, being a novelist is a great experience because of that feeling of complete ownership of every every bit of it. But then when you can, if you wrote the novel and the screenplay and you direct it, that's, yeah. a, that's an equal level of you know, the feeling that you didn't have to compromise too much. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, it would be probably ask me anything um, because the book the book was called Undiscovered Girl, and it still to this day kills me that I changed the title for the movie. But there was all this pressure on me because they they say, oh, if, if it begins with an A, you know, you'll be higher listed on on fucking Direct TV. And it just to, to separate the movie from the book <laughs> pissed me off. I'm just sorry that we sep I separated them. It bums me out.
but um, but that was that along with the sequel were just real joys to do. I mean, just pure pleasure. Um, and there was a, there was everything that could go wrong went wrong in terms of just bullshit logistical things and money and a lot of stuff went wrong. And so it was, there was a lot that was grueling about doing it, but it was artistically so fulfilling that it just didn't matter, you know. And I look back on it now and I I forget all the negativity. It was just a great great thing. Right. The yeah, common yeah, theme yeah. here. In a, in a different way, it's it's mine. Mine's going to be plastic, and it's because just like you guys just said, it was the first time that I took complete control of a project from beginning to end, and it was going to be my vision, you know, succeed or fail, big, all on me. And so when it does well and it comes out and and you get that success from it, um, you know, it's just you know it's so fulfilling. I mean, you know, Terry and Allison, you guys understand that. I mean, you just said it. You know, it's like there's something about like taking your vision. And not having all the, the people telling you, you know, like, hey, do this, change that, that kind of stuff. And um, it was one of those projects where everybody was telling me, this is career suicide. Don't do this book. And I was like, well, if this is my, if this is into my, my, you know, my, my journey here, I'm going to do it my way. And luckily it wasn't. But like, you know, there's something so satisfying about like doing it all yourself. And, you know, obviously I had a team around me as we all did on all our mm-hmm. projects. But, um, you know, when, when you take that onus and go listen it's gonna it's i'm gonna i'm gonna bear the the shoulders on this one you know like uh so plastic was you know to the date is it was my favorite of my work you read a lot of hollywood yeah. books so often when somebody is doing something good it's amazing how many people will line up to tell you not to do it mm-hmm. yeah. the book that uh, soderbergh wrote about uh, sex lies and videotape like everybody was like the title can't work it's impossible you know? <laughs> everybody was all these naysayers or what was the other one where um Oh, damn it. There's read another book where I couldn't believe that like even the most important, oh, that movie, it was the movie Unzipped. It's a documentary about the fashion industry. And this guy, Israq Mizrahi, wants to do a fashion show with a scrim hanging down and you see the models changing their clothes. So they're naked back behind the scrim, right? right. And the whole movie, everyone's telling him not to do it and telling him, and it ends with this spectacularly beautiful fashion show. And, and it just showed, it, to me, it was, it was a, a big thing grit small where you just get to see right in front of your eyes in a microcosm that the world what lines up against you so you just do your vision stay mm-hmm. true to it you know yeah, and it's the truth yourself but we rarely get to do that because we live we work in expensive businesses mm-hmm. you know i was uh gonna chime in and i was just smiling the whole time each of you were talking about your favorites and you all pretty much had the same message i'm smiling because i've only ever written one thing and it was because I had a dream and I wrote down the dream and I was like, I got to turn this into a movie. And I turned it into a script and I brought it to some producers who I've worked with before that are very good. And they were like, we got to make this movie. And so got a team together. I did the crowdfunding, filmed it. And um, I just the feeling of directing it, writing it, acting in it, like producing it, the whole, the pride and just sticking to it. And the big thing too, that goes with everything you just said, is they had this big time guy come along and be like, hey, I'm willing to uh, finance your movie without you having to do crowdfunding, but I'll have to take, you know, creative rights, basically. And I was like, uh, no, I'm doing this my way, my vision, my movie. We're getting it done this way and only this way. Um, and so we did. And we're actually now finally here recently, actually a couple of days ago, which is funny that all this happened now, uh, going into post-production finally. I'm going to finally finish my movie and get to put it out there. So it's just a great feeling. Everything you guys just said is exactly how I yeah. felt making this, yeah. the entire process. You're baby though, you know? And it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> in a weird way, it doesn't matter what happens next. It yes. matters if you'll finish it. And that mm-hmm. feeling is, is very profound satisfaction. Yes. Good luck with it. Thank yeah. you. If you ever want to need to make it into a comic, a graphic novel, I have a friend who's big shot. You're in Florida, you're in Utah. Who's where? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from Florida. Oh, right. and, oh, there you go. Yeah, but I'm in Utah now, yeah. Right, you're in Vancouver. Okay, right. So we have about uh, three or four minutes. Uh, so the last question. Um, so Doug, you know, he wrote Plastic, which has like more like risque adult elements. Uh, Allison, um, Ask Me Anything kind of had uh, some sexual nature to it. And um, for those that don't know, like his ex-father-in-law was Zell McKean, who is like one of the big uh, risque writers. Um, I don't know if Terrence has wrote anything, but like with Did the- you know Zellman in your day? Did you ever meet Zellman? Oh, no, no, he was ahead of me. Let's see. 
I don't know if uh, Terry's ever written any more adult risque stuff, but uh, so like when you're writing stuff that's like outside of the Hollywood room, like more risque or adult than the general audience is used to seeing, like um, how like do you guys find a like um, yourselves getting a lot of pushback on um, writing stuff like that? Um, or like how, I have one specific thing that about you? that. Um, I was hired to do the howling. And you know, that premise was that a group of people who are werewolves decide they like being werewolves and want to isolate themselves from the world. And I said, why do they like being werewolves? And I finally decided it must be the sex. They have consciousness <laughs> of the sex without all of the guilt and recrimination and all that crap. So I, you know, I littered it throughout the movie. And one of the first things they did when they rewrote me was to lift it out of the movie because <laughs> they nobody understood what the hell I was going for. That's life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you had the right vision. I, I, you know, I'd like to think so. Thank you. Um, you know, um, I think I'd, I'd feel sorry for anyone doing anything sexual going forward. I mean, oh Jesus, oh Jesus Christ! I can't even imagine how that would be. I, I mean, they wouldn't. Even, I, I wouldn't even be allowed to write a novel. And two, I would I have two movies and two novels narrated by by one's a high school senior female, and one is a a, a recent like twenty one year old female near college graduate. I mean, they wouldn't even let me. I'd be I'd be appropriating their stories, you know. And then the fact that men are sexualizing them. There's a, I mean, it's both movies are feminist. Both movies are clearly not in support of the men that try to exploit these girls. So, so yeah. the, the point of the movie, but at the same time, they have dark endings where the women become somehow slightly complicit in their own downfalls by the choices that they make. They end up in violence. Um, of course, the men are far worse because they're committing the violence, but it, all that's wrapped up in their sexuality. And you know, I honestly don't know how I could do that, but at the time, even, even recently, it was not easy. In other words, I still, there wasn't the level of sexuality and nudity I would have liked if I could have made this movie earlier. And my first movie, Red Meat, is literally about three misogynistic guys and their relationships with women, and mm. it's really sexual. And that was in the 90s, and I could do it then. Like the actresses yeah. were willing to get partially, you know, somewhat naked. But I was always very respectful of the women. And like, I really didn't, I wanted to, I didn't want to do anything with an actress where if that were my girlfriend, I'd want to freaking blow my brains out, you know, because I had dated actresses. I know the pain of having them do jobs where they're exploited or treated sh really shittily um, or hit on by directors and that kind of stuff. So, you know, but it's a complicated issue. This is not a good time to be doing anything erotic. I don't think. Especially, especially given the onset of the COVID. I mean, mm. how does anybody make a movie? What are the COVID protocols? You can't go how close to a person? Uh, I know, but they're, what they're doing is they're just testing them. In, they're just testing them all the every time. day, yeah. every single day. Every single day. Yeah. And, you know, actors will climb over their, you know, sainted grandmother to get a job. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so if you get a job, you don't care if you're all actors do anyway is go straight home with their and learn their lines. And if all you have to do to have a part is to not catch COVID, you know, they're going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you're always going to get pushed back anytime you're making people uncomfortable. And, you know, that, that you just, as a writer, I, I, I won't lie. I, I get an enjoyment out of making people feel uncomfortable when they're, when they're reading my stuff. <laughs> and so you like you know, Robert. Gold. You like Robert. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, yeah, I want to push those buttons just a little bit because I think that's what people need to kind of evolve a little bit. And so with me, I'm fine with the pushback. Not everybody is. I mean, I've been at, I've been at comic book conventions that had people, you know, call me various names without even reading my book, just based on the premise of a book. And so I'm, I've grown used to that. I'll say some of my friends don't deal well with that. So, you know, it's up to you on whether you think you can handle it. I want to pitch you your sequel to Plastic. It's called Rubber. <laughs> all right gentlemen so it's been an hour you yeah. all have been amazing um me and robert definitely appreciate you letting us interview you three um good luck with this enterprise it's a great idea thank you to have people just talk about you know you uh, are all you guys should look should expect facebook friend notices from me
Yeah, please do. I wanted to say it was really great meeting all of you and getting to know you and your wonderful stories. It's just inspiring, motivating, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. Where's the best place to find um, some of your work? Like, is it on Amazon Prime or you guys um, like through a certain website? Like, where do you, where would you point people towards that want to see your work now? Amazon. Yeah, for me, I mean, any kind of, you can go to the, anything that has any, any, anybody that carries comics. So even Amazon, they have several of my trades on there too, but obviously Comixology, which is owned by Amazon. So that's kind of redundant. Um, any, any local comic shops too should be able to order anything that I've done. And Allison, where can we find your stuff? Took I off. Allison, yeah, I think Allison took off on us. Uh, Allison took off on us. Got it. <laughs> All right. All right. So I'm, we're going to assume he's on Amazon too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, that's a good assumption. <laughs> For anyone that's watching, this has been the industry hey now, and definitely check out uh, Allison Burnett and Doug Wagner and um, Karen Winkless and um, all their work, and uh, you'll really enjoy some of the titles that you see. So we hope that you check out the work. All right. Thanks, Thank you, all. everyone.